All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just so you know, can we get started? Um, just so you know, we are um, now live on YouTube, so um, please don't discuss any more patient sensitive details. Just want to be um, cautious of that. So, um, welcome to SWOC. Um, we're going to learn about ostomies today and what wound nurses need to know about it. Um, a big shout out, thank you to Pam from Hollister. She's hosting our meals. So, um, once Sue is done, then Pam will have 10 minutes and she can talk to us about products, questions. I'm not sure what you have planned, but you got your 10 minutes. Very, very short informational thing. Great. Okay, and then, um, so a couple announcements. Um, so today we're offering continuing education, continuing education credits for the first time. And we're gonna charge $5 um, for each time because we gotta raise some money for SWAC and um, for more equipment to improve our YouTube channels. So, um, and it's gonna be 1.5 continuing ed credits for tonight for $5, so pretty good deal. Um, and for those who are online watching um, on YouTube, we haven't figured out how to do that for people who are not in attendance. So we're hoping to do that down the road, but right now you have to be in attendance to actually get the credits. Um, and then a big announcement for next month, we are gonna have SWAC, and the, so it'll be June 14th, and that's um, the day after the Woonostomy Continents um, Conference in Philadelphia. So um, hopefully you guys can all make it. Um, it's, the title will be The Science of Debridement, and it's, um, it's a workshop. Uh, the woman's name is Susan Reed. She's a certified wound ostomy continence nurse, and she works for Organogenesis as their medical science liaison. And so the beginning of her presentation will be on slideshows, and we'll be discussing different types of debridement and the science behind it. And then when she's done with that, then we're gonna put everything away, meaning get rid of all the food, and she's gonna bring out the pig's feet and the curettes and the blades and all this other stuff, and we're gonna actually run through some exercises and put into practice or practice what we've learned from the slideshow. Um, so that's gonna be something you definitely wanna attend, and you can get continuing ed for that too. Um, now, unfortunately, because this is, um, that particular presentation is a paid rep from a vendor, we won't be able to broadcast that on YouTube. So I'm sorry about that. And then we'll have the summer off. And then we'll be back with in September, on September 13th. Um, so any other questions here? Any? Okay, so our speaker today, let's get started, is Sue Thompson. She's a certified wound ostomy continence nurse. And I think that's all I'm gonna say. I'll let you introduce any other th information you want to about yourself. Yeah. And just make sure you do the Oprah thing, you know, so I get The Oprah it. thing, okay. Yeah. So my practice has been, I started in home health and built my um, knowledge base and practice through home health at, initially for 10 years. And uh, also, at that time very important for me to work at Virginia Mason at a part-time basis so that I got experience with ostomy because I find that to really to get the experience for uh, ostomy acute setting is very important and so if you want to be an ostomy nurse I highly encourage you to work part-time somewhere to get that experience for a good year because a lot of things will come in and then you get to see what happens you put it on in two hours and you know it didn't work where home health you put it on and you went away and you'll be back tomorrow <laughs> so then um, I'm now working in a wound in a wound clinic with um, an ostomy uh, there's an ostomy clinic included within the wound care so do I just yep just do that and I'm not in the way of anything okay so objectives um, going on. Uh, for those who don't know how a stoma is made, it's too bad I have to hold this because I'm a real hands person. Um, the stoma is pulled out right through the skin. The intestine is pulled out through the skin and just cuffed back as if you were pulling your sleeve over your hand and then folding it back and then it's tacked down to the skin and very quickly within days that that stoma begins to adhere to the skin pretty phenomenal I think that part of it 
Um, there are a couple of types of stoma, and that depends on the surgery. So you have an end stoma, being that they pull it out and you go from your mouth and out that hole, and they've either removed your rectum or you look questioning. <laughs> but so I want to remind you if you do have questions as I go along, please ask. So the end stoma, you pull it out and you either have a rectum that's waiting waiting there with a with a, a sewn about a six inch to eight inch piece of intestine waiting to be reattached, which is the Hartman's pouch. Dr. Hartman, thank you. Otherwise your rectum's been removed and you have an end that's going to be permanent. You have a loop. The loop is an intestine that is pulled out um, and just picked up, sliced down the, the center of it and the stoma curls open like cauliflower and they, any other understandings of that? Oh. They were doing a treatment on the person, and so they had infections, and so they brought it up. Have you heard of that? The family brought it up, and they were yeah. instilling the mess. So they, this was an inst for a treatment installation, probably for cancer. I'm assuming that meds were needed, and they wanted to localize the a, medication. I don't think so. She had had a perforated bowel. Perforated bowel. She So they were instilling the meds through the muco fistula. That's right. Got it. That's right. And I know it's her complete bowel rest as well. Because if both ends are open, there's no buildup of um, air and, and whatnot. So I've always heard that it was to decompress, especially after like that preparation. Oh. Okay. Well, but the other end, the Hartman's pouch, is also for that decompression. It's so not they. open though, is it? It, it is not. Well, it's open to the rectum. It's so it can pass gas, but the upper end is sewn off waiting to be anastomosed. So it's resting. I had a patient asking, he saw that he had a Hartman's pouch and called to see me. He said he couldn't find his Hartman's pouch. Oh, <laughs> this nurse had a, a patient. I don't know if you guys can hear on YouTube what, what the discussion is, but um, this nurse was saying that the patient called looking for where is my Hartman's pouch. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so let's discuss ileostomies. It is a small bowel disease. So it is um, for inflammatory bowel for uh, chronic ulcerative colitis, to have an ileostomy is the cure for that disease. Crohn's mimics, or maybe ulcerative colitis mimics, but the two of those diagnoses are very close and sometimes very hard to distinguish. And so Crohn's passes past the large bowel and will ulcer be ulcerative from your mouth to your rectum can be Crohn's ulcers where ulcerative colitis is strictly in the bowel. The same with familial polyps, strictly in the bowel. So then an ileostomy is the cure for that and they will take, they will take the um, large bowel because those polyps are so many. And I forget what the percentage is. It's a very high percentage. Even if you have a couple polyps, those polyps, if left, turn to cancer. Um, and then, of course, there's congenital issues and cancer. Your uh, ileostomies, or, or not ileostomy, but your ileum starts, the duodenum from your stomach is the duodenum to the jejunum to the ileum. They used to do um, some surgeries with the jejunum, but that is the area that has the most absorption of your electrolytes and water and does a lot of the work. So they they use the ileum for the most part. The biggest take home in this for an ileostomate is that I tell them the first thing, I tell them in hospital, the first thing that's going to send you back to the hospital is because you're not feeling well and you're not drinking. 
I said, I don't care if you're eating yet, but you have to drink to keep up because your ileostomy is already working. So even though you don't feel good, you have to push yourself to do your liquids. So my thing is that I teach them to have a glass of water, a full 8 to 10 ounce glass of water in the morning with their meds, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and at bedtime. That's only five. Then in the fridge, they have to have another five glasses sitting there that they know they have to get through that in their day. So that they can't just say, oh yeah, I'm sure I drink 10 because a lot of them don't really realize they think they're drinking but they're just not feeling up to it yet so that's my thing to make sure that they know that they're drinking that much ileostomies can be high volume depending on where in the ileum they are and sometimes i just i don't i need to see a surgery really i'd love to do that and talk to the surgeons i think that sometimes they don't even know why an ileostomy is high volume um, when they, di they didn't expect it to be really a high producer. Um, the other thing I tell the patient before they leave the hospital, the second thing that's going to send them back here to the hospital is a blockage. Because now, in a couple of weeks, they're going to feel good again, and they're going to go out, and they're going to have steak and a salad. How delightful. They've been waiting for that for a couple months. The salad itself, just iceberg lettuce, not spinach, not, not the red leaf, but iceberg, that core can be very blocking for an ileostomy. And you chew on steak, well, if you think about the last time you chewed on steak, did you pay attention to how well you chewed it? We take a couple bites and we and we swallow it and so I tell them if you have to chew it in the beginning you have to chew it really well and take a smaller portion and um, don't realize that how much you have to chew a salad just even if it's a lettuce salad tomato skins the skin of the tomato can be very blocking so they have, to, they have to try all foods. It's not that they can't have it. They just have to trial it. Because a lot of ileostomies can, can deal with any food, no problem. But it's just that surgical procedure and how, how well it came through the stomach line and how much, you know, how big their intestine was and a whole bunch of, whole bunch of things that go into that. Um, ileostomy folks are going to have to learn that their effluent is very, very caustic. Nurses have to know that it's very, very caustic. My first, within that first couple months after I've gotten my certification and I was doing home health, a patient called me and said, hey, I'm leaking already. I know you were coming at two, but I'm already leaking. I'll be there in a half hour, no problem. Just hold on. Well, by the time I got there, she was already totally red and lightly weepy from, from that 30 minutes, 30 minutes. And you can imagine if you're in a skilled care facility, you have no time. You have less time than a lot of anybody else. And if you, oh, it's a little leak, I'll, I'll just tape it. And, and that it kills them because then the next day they can't get a pouch to stick and then in a week they call me well I'm not getting a pouch to stick either <laughs> for for a couple days so all right so just to know that it's so um, caustic and ileostomy uh, effluent is alkaline not acidic it eats you like acid but it's alkaline you also have a lot of uh, protein loss and electrolyte loss, and some people more than others. I, I have my patients, um, you know, a lot of these electrolyte drinks are out there, but they don't have to have multiples of electrolytes unless they maybe have a high volume. And I tell them, and they don't like it. Some of them don't like it. So I say, well, dilute it, but at least get one bottle in through the day, tea, what are some of the other things you guys 
tell them to to drink up to replace those electrolytes yeah like pedialyte yeah Yeah. A water with electrolytes, right. And then there's this new go-to um, electrolyte drink. And one of my uh, support group ostomates is doing triathlons. And he has found out that if he drinks that, he doesn't have output. It's a drink he can have. If he does the other drinks that have high electrolyte in them, it makes him stop. It makes him go more. And so, but that go-to for whatever reason doesn't trigger, um, he has less output for his runs. Kind of interesting. That's the name of the drink? Go-to. Mm-hmm. They're kind of, they're out there. Yeah, I don't think they're special. They're right next to the Propel and the all, all of those other drinks. Yeah, in the grocery store. So colostomies are in the colon, right? Um, most of the time, you can look at a patient and go, oh, it's on the right side, it must be an ileostomy. If it's on the left side, it's a colostomy. Docs will trick you. <laughs> because on occasion, you can be pretty safe that, yes, okay, it's on the right, it's a colostomy. You can ask. But on occasion, they've had a reconnective surgery and they've flipped it around and the colostomy is on the left. Or vice versa. So in the large bowel, the diseases that you can have, oops, are pretty much um, the ulcerative colitis, the cancers, the constipation issues with perforation, spina bifida, uh, spinal cord injuries have um, motility issues, uh, infant congenital disease, I put in there, Hirschsprungs, there's others, uh, trauma, of course, and then um, fistula diversions till heal, till they heal is, they'll do a colostomy times two. So again, you've got your, um, I should have done it the other way around because from the small intestine, you actually start from the bottom at the cecum, right? That's where vitamin B12 is actually absorbed and it is also where ileostomies are often um, made in that in that area and another thing to think about for ileostomies is that over time they may need to have vitamin b12 replacement because of that so back to colostomies now that we've done the ileostomy through there the ascending ascending is on your right right um, if you have an ostomy, a colostomy on the ascending colon because of a tumor, because of trauma, um, I can't think of what other else, um, they will be very caustic because that is still very liquid, liquidy coming from the ileostomy. As it comes across the transverse, that becomes pasty and less caustic and more smelly as it comes down the sigmoid to the rectum, you can get constipated again. If you had been prone to constipation prior to a colostomy, you can get constipated again. And so there's a lot of teaching that happens if that was your main reason, a, a constipated perforation. We need to teach them that you can get this again. We need to work on it and a change of diet. So blockage. In a colostomy is usually because the stool is constipated, not sometimes because of a stricture, but most of the time it's it's blockage that I have found. Um, and then I put in there the fruits, the vegetables, the brands. There's some meds that help help with constipation, and you need to be aware of any of these. You know the anastomotic leak when they first have it. We need to be kind of watching how well they feel after that surgery because if there's a little sewing leak, the anastomotic leak, um, they'll be getting quite sick again and back to surgery. 
So unfortunately, if you have a colostomy, you can be very smelly. Um, and it seems that sometimes even more smelly than if I were to go, because I don't smell. But, but an ileostomy doesn't really smell. The patient may think they smell, and they can smell a little bit of a sour smell. And I find that ostomy patients are certainly much more sensitive to odor than we are. And I tell them, if you think you have a leak, ask your partner, ask your friend, hey, do I stink? Because a lot of times you're fine, right? And then just be very good with the cleansing. And I think we, I might go through that, but as long as I'm here and mentioning it, um, one of the odors I find for colostomates are the emptying of the pouch the end gets dirty and they haven't been taught to clean it and the nurses aren't any good at it either and I tell patients yes I'm teaching you to fold that end back and make a cuff and empty your stool and clean it from there with your finger and then pull it back and roll it up and keep that bottom area the bottom two three inches at least two um, clean because otherwise you will be smelling a light odor and I said, the nurses, it's not their pouch. They have no idea. And they would be more concerned about it if it was theirs. So that's one, one thing that I hear from patients. Well, my nurse just dumps it. Well, as you get more in control of what you're doing, this is what you can do for that odor control there. Questions? Yep. So, um, I wanted to throw in um, J pouches. I don't see too many J pouches only because I think they have their surgery and they do well. I only see them when they're having issues and their issues would be pouchitis. So let me, let me start by saying that the pouches are formed by, they, they will remove the colon totally. And these are people who want the J pouch, they don't want a stoma they it will be all inside so it's very it, it sounds like a great deal to me i might try it myself and they make the j pouch they have to puzzle a j pouch together out of the ileostomy out of ilium and that is your holding tank a small holding tank that expands over time and then they are connected from there they are connected to the rectum this procedure is done in stages so they will have a relaxing period where they will have an ileostomy before this so that this pouch area can heal before their stool coming through it and the anastomotic um, section where it connects to the rectum has to relax also before it starts having but the thing is about this is you're still going to have ileostomy effluent so it's going to be diarrhea coming into a pouch that's going to be able to gather it but that's the thing it gathers it and gives you a little bit of time and over time your sensation about that your body learns and you can control and get to a bathroom but it is like having eight stools in a day and you do get used to that as well I do find that right after surgery with their with that diarrhea stool they need to have like a camel septine because a little bit of squirt in that whole rectal area gets gets irritated because it is diarrhea and so camel septine helps that a lot with the that um, the concerns are of course just the construction of that pouch there's some twisting and whatnot that goes on and they uh, have sometimes twisting and kinking and may require a second surgery to just kind of catch the area that gets twisted. Uh, they have strictures mostly at the bowel, at the um, pouch and anal connection area. And the pouchitis is, is one of the big ones. In that pouch, things just become, if it's not angled quite right, it can become a little bit of like sludge in there. And then that 
intestine gets a little bit infected because it's sitting kind of like an ulcerative colitis where it where your food pops into a little side hole and that food irritates that intestine so in the pouch if it doesn't completely flush you will end up with pouchitis I do think that they must have this down because I know they do them frequently and I don't see those patients which is great I think I covered this they do learn this is a um, for any diarrhea problem or ileostomy problem um, what foods thicken and what foods give them issues um, what meds can be bulking and then so I can I can go through this for the um, YouTube I forgot to, I sh I'm on that so foods that thicken the applesauce bananas rice creamy peanut butter potatoes cheese marshmallows I have patients who come who want to who take three to four marshmallows before they come in to see me in the clinic to keep them from going while they while I take the pouch off it works quite well <laughs> and that's three to four marshmallows pretzels apparently toast yogurt and tapioca yeah yeah it's about 10 minutes yeah I'd like to, you know the next time I have diarrhea I think I'll just have some marshmallows <laughs> I mean some more is any time right <laughs> Tubes. I don't. I'm not sure. I understand what you're asking. Fecal containment tubes. Oh, rectal tubes. It would not be a good idea because they're and it's had surgery, so it's been modified, and I would not want to mess with that stricture. So we need to know that they had, and that patient needs to know that the medical field needs to no, be aware that they have a J pouch yeah, yeah. right and no no they would not want to have a rectal and tube, tube will not hold anyway because the rectum the sphincter doesn't have such a good tone either right it does it does, it does. but you're going after the sphincter though you're going into this small pouch and 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 at a I don't think any doc will and it's different it's not as flexible no, it's yeah. scarred yeah yeah I guess, yeah. yeah I guess they would not because you have to inflate the balloon yeah the you know it would it would have to be up to the doc I mean yeah. I could see where possibly they could do that but I I wouldn't I wouldn't do it <laughs> I let the doc decide but um I don't think he would I think he'd be afraid of strictures yeah, and I, I, yeah but a good thought yeah. you're right you're right um so urostomies urostomies woo woo finger you get heavy um because of cancer chronic cystitis congenital issues um neurogenic issues spinal cord injuries that are having issues with catheters will choose to have a urostomy is like spina bifida. It's it's a lot easier to have it here than down here when you're in the wheelchair all the time, particularly if you have immobility issues and of course trauma. So it is an ileal conduit. You take the majority of them. You take about six inches of the ileum. You sew. You put the ileum back together. You sew off one end of the uh, the small intestine and the other end that other hot dog end you bring out through your stomach and make a stoma but you have attached the ureters to that hot dog so um, I find that it's amazing docs thought they could do that I mean but it is that's a conduit it is a passing through that's all it is there is no sphincter there's no control of your urine um, it is constant because your 
your water wheel in our bodies are working constantly. So when they go to change that pouch, there's no quick three second time maybe. Um, and they have to they have to learn little things to help them with that. You know, so if if they're going, um, they can put a tampon into the stoma and let it soak up until they get they they should have everything ready first. But then the tampon can go in and they can some I've had a patient just leave it in the pouch or she gets it at least tucked under and then she can take it out. Sometimes she, it's dropped in and she's left it and I'm like, it doesn't clog? And she said, no, that's fine. So, okay. Um, paper towels rolled up and, and poked into the stoma to just absorb for that short period of time so they can get that skin dry and get that pouch on. Um, the effluent from an ileal conduit will be mucousy. You, you know, if you're a nurse on the floor and you're looking at that, you're thinking, oh my gosh, she's got an infection because there's all these mucousy strands in there because that is a live colon and the colon's job is to produce mucus. I threw it in. It's kind of in the wrong spot, I noticed. Um, if you're a vegetarian on a vegetarian diet, or you drink a fair amount of milk or carbonation, your urine can be alkaline. If you eat a lot of meat and on a paleo diet, it will be more acidic. And there are times when you will want to adjust that because you may have kidney stones and you can change your urine by your diet. Again, the odor for urostomy, oops. Is this, does that have to be in? Oops. There we go. Thank you. Was that for the YouTube folks? Uh, it's the power cord. Otherwise the power out. cord. Oh, well. Who needs power? Um, where were we? Um, so, ileal conduit. Any questions on that one? A, a ureterostomy. I have never seen it, but I don't work in peds, and this is where um, where it happens most of the time. It would be urgent, and they just take the ureters and pull them out and attach them to the outside of the skin, and they just pour urine out into a diaper. Um, these are kids who have maybe congenital deformities that there are going to be some time where they're going to have to do some reconstruction, and... Um, but the, the ureters are only about 10 inches long. So adults will never have them. I can't say never. Who knows? But um, not likely. And a vesicostomy would be where they bring the... And um, the belly button one is phenomenal because you don't see this, the little tiny little bit of a stoma that's there. It's made from the um, appendectomies. So an, uh, uh, they will do an appendectomy to take that appendic tubing because it's stronger and tougher than other tubings in our body. And I guess we don't need our appendix. So we'll use it here in our belly button so that it can take a catheter and not get damaged and get poked through. It's stronger, stronger tissue. It's continent. They make it. They they do make a continent. Yeah, a, a continent. Yeah. Cool. I want one if I have to have a urostomy. That sounds like like the Coke or Yes. It sounds like the Coke. Yeah. Only the Coke. Right. So they'll make it for bladder or they'll make it for stool. And, and they make a pouch, so the J pouch is stool. The Coke is for bladder, right? No, the Coke is also for bowel. Also for bowel? Right? Yeah. yeah. Do no, the, I think that they've, the J pouch has come around and the technique has improved. Coke was so long ago. Yeah. does it 
so there's not really the surgeons that are doing this coke pouch so when they malfunction there's not a lot of options yeah, yeah. so ostomy. it's a 1950s it is, yeah. time um anyway so those are continent diversions where they make a pouch again with a a, a sphincter and a stoma that can be catheterized either through the skin or again through the umbilicus I want to go over your documentation for a stoma right there are many things you can tell by looking at the stoma you want to know what color it is if after surgery it's getting dusky and kind of purple color you want to make sure doc knows that it because it's getting ischemic and he's probably just gonna watch it and make sure that you know even if it gets black and SRE looking, he's just gonna watch it and see what happens as, as the couple of days pass because he certainly doesn't wanna go back in because there's probably not, there's issues. <laughs> um, but if you look at a, a patient who comes in and you look at their stoma, even if they've had it for years and it's really pale pink, they're anemic and you wanna, you wanna address that. Otherwise, they should be a beefy red stoma. Um, they can have edema, particularly after surgery. They're going to have the stoma itself will be swollen, and will, you can see that it's it's blistery, juicy looking. Um, but if it's an established stoma and it's coming into ER, it's because they've got probably got a blockage, and the stoma is is being affected. Um, there are, or trauma, I've also seen that. I, <laughs> a patient's daughter getting off to soccer opened the door to just get out quickly and just happened to hit the stoma right, right on it. It was only swollen and bruised for a couple of days, like any of us would be, but, and no damage, but just some edema. There can be some bleeding. The bleeding could be, is it, Crohn's, right? Is it some uh, some other kind of ulcer, the, the intestinal something or other? Is it so you have to look? Is it in, on the intestine itself? Is it on the stoma, or is it down around the edge of the stoma where it connects to the skin? Because if you are, if you have that um, that edge of the stoma in um, effluent it can it can grow granulomas and be like hypergran tissue down there and very fragile easily treated with silver nitrate um, or it could be a suture line sutures that are being affected if it's shortly after surgery so you kind of want to sleuth a little bit and figure out is it on the intestine is it inside where's that blood coming from is it just because they have a gastric bleed or is it actually the stoma? Um, this picture has um, an issue of the skin, the mucocutaneous incision line there. At the two to three o'clock area, there's some slough. Anybody do anything with that slough? Are you worried about it? Treated like a wound, exactly. So you can put stoma adhesive powder on it, eye line it, fill it. If the wound is two centimeters deep, I wouldn't be packing it. Just leave it alone and treat the top. It may you can put an alginate on top, and then your and then your barrier down because that's that's like treating a wound that has alginate and a hydrocolloid, right? Sure. Usually, if I have mixed powder, the wound was very slow to heal. But just using um, the alginate, the hydrofiber, Arcocell, and glued and spent, and over it, a piece of beacon, and then the pouching. Yep. Usually heals within. So she's using the hydrofiber, 
the aqua cell, the hydrofiber, and a hydro th or a thin duoderm. Yep, and then an Eakin ring. So some of your stomas aren't going to deal with all of that layer because they need to be flat. Um, some can, for sure. Um, it's it'll all you'll have to play with it. It's just a wound, and so you were nurses know how to treat those, and you'll figure it out. There are times when I have just included that separation area in the opening of the pouch because it's it's producing too much um, uh, juices. It's sweeping too much, and it is interfering with the seal of the ileostomy. And so do not worry if you have to seal that in and make and make it apart. It will it will heal, and the stool in it is not gonna is not gonna create an issue. And I also the patients are very concerned about that. The stool is in my wound. That's it's okay. Even your even it, your midline and that the um, ostomy dumps into it. It's it's usually not an issue. I haven't had an issue ever in my 15 years where the intestine got or the um, midline incision got infected because they were stooling into it. It was already on its way because of other issues from deeper down. Right? I don't know why we don't get an E. coli infection from that, but we don't. And yet we can get it elsewhere. <laughs> So I think we kind of, um, some of the issues, particularly for ileostomies, uh, colostomies also, the summer is coming, and underneath those pouches, they can be sweating, and they can get yeast infections, and they can be, um, they can all of a sudden have allergy to the pouch that they've used for the past five years, and now they have to look for some other, um, some other thing. Um, folliculitis. The hair follicles can get infected. Um, shaving can either worsen it or it can make it go away. Um, particularly, <laughs> I've had guys in particular um, think that, okay, I can take this, and they, they just rip off their ostomy pouch. No problem, I can take that. Just rip it off, it's okay. Well, no, because you create little, little fissures in your skin then, then can cause irritations and you can get infections under there. Um, I talked about stitch abscesses. Urine crystals. Have, ever, have you ever seen urine crystals? I've one time. That's all. And again, it was a vinegar soak. I had to look it up to know, to remember how to take care of that, but it, it melted it right away. And then I would say, okay, to that patient, Maybe change your diet. Are the crystals forming because they're more alkaline, or are they um, become becoming acidic? Or if vinegar takes it away, they have to be pretty basic, right? So they're more alkaline. Radiation can be quite the um, quite damaging just because the skin becomes fragile. So taking off your pouch just as gently as you can. Um, can still irritate that skin. And then there's pressure from your convex pouch, mostly. You have a convex on, and you've had an ileostomy for years, and you've had a flat tummy until you turn 60-something, and then your tummy's out there, and you're now getting, you're wearing that belt, and you're now getting pressure from the appliance itself. So to be aware of that. And here's two pictures. Sorry, YouTubers. Um, oh, they can. Oh, great. So the one that's on your right, let's talk about that one. Um, there are no skin issues that I can see. At least there's, you know, that looks like they have a midline incision that has tape on it. Um, but is there any th concerns that you guys see? Creases, yep, that three and nine, almost three and ten o'clock area. 
What's that? Isn't it subject retracted? Retracted? Mm, it, it probably protrudes pretty good. The problem is there's something above it that's protruding out. Hernia. What's that? Hernia. Um, it's probably not a hernia. I think it's fat. It's fat. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the tummy. And so there is tension on that stoma, which is what you wanted to say, except that it's got a nice budding stoma on it. It's just tight. And so that's probably what caused those creases as well, that tension. And they have a little bit of a, a fatty lip. So they just have to know that when they place that stoma, they have to lift the lip to place the pouch down so that the stoma, um, so that you don't get leakage actually at that 12 o'clock area and irritation. If they lift it up, they can get their pouch right, right around it. The other one on your left, it has a couple issues. The 12 o'clock area, that pouch is, I don't know whether they're cutting it just a little bit oval or, um, and then 6 o'clock, there's some issue too. So you have to get the, I would say maybe they need a stoma adhesive ring that might help the 12 o'clock area, but something's happening down below. Any insight on that? Any guesses? Is that a pyoderma? Yes, yeah. it's a pyoderma. And, and to know that some of these diagnoses that require ileostomy um, are susceptible to pyoderma. That's a lovely stoma. That's a urine, urostomy. And they've been just bringing their pouch out bigger and bigger and bigger. As the skin got irritated, they made it a little bit bigger to include the irritation, and then it got bigger. So now <coughs> my job is to come back in and try and bring it back down to right around that. They never really had a stoma, it looks like. Not much of one. little hernia happening as the, um, the stoma size will change if they gain weight and also pregnancy and a hernia. Um, that stoma size, so just know that they're going to have to maybe have a pre-cut to adjust to that more frequently until that gets adjusted for them. Um, there are abdominal binders, and I think that we should be more proactive to get abdominal binders on after surgery, particularly in our heavy set clientele. That's my own personal opinion. So where do you get your bariatric size abdominal binders? I had a great dilemma. I had two patients that were bariatric bariatric uh, size I have no idea actually because I haven't dealt with that big. Um, I guess yes. We um, could sew them. I know new makes custom ostomy belts, but I don't know about it being a bariatric size. Well, so they could. Just, yeah, I mean, they would just They could, actually. Sure. If you're in the hospital, can you hook them together with the Velcro? You can take two, too. So you can take two abdominal binders. The, um, so everyone that, uh, so I went through the series of emailing a bunch of people, both like company, supply companies and um, other companies, and they recommend that they don't stick them together sure so, because it's not made for that mm -hmm. so your reps aren't gonna stand by you but what other options do you really have so I did find out that they said uh, Mary Catherine's will custom make cool it's probably expensive though I'm guessing <laughs> well I have a ostimate at uh, um, 59 years so he was born with it and had to have an ostomy. He makes all his own belts so they can get the material online, but that's not, most people are not gonna be able to do that. Um, but I would bet you New Hope would do that. They make all their belts mm -hmm. and, but again, it's gonna cost them. Mary Catherine's, sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we could all go into jobs, we could do that. If you Google bariatric abdominal binder, you Bariatric abdominal binder. The yeah. I found online was for 110. 
Oh. Inches. Uh -huh. 110 inches. And you had how many inches? 100 and how many? 30? Yeah. Yeah. So we need a plus plus. And we, yeah. You know, ostomy nurses are nothing but creative. So I'm. an abdominal binder over the pouch. No. I put the binder on, mark where that pouch is, take it off, <laughs> and cut. But your hole is much smaller than you think. So make your hole small. You can always trim it, but you can't take a big one and take it back down. So when you get that out, it's, it looks like it's fairly like a nickel size, maybe quarter size, and then it, it'll it'll stretch so I wouldn't I'd start out at a quarter and then trim as you need have you guys done that too mm -hmm. yeah and it works okay they're coming with um, um, they're coming out I have a belt here they're coming out this is new hope they're coming out with belts like this for bariatric because the thinner the thinner belts just fold and make sores in them and so they're coming out with even wider yeah. width than this and this just slips over top this is not a hernia belt this is this is for holding down your your three and nine o'clock belt in a larger person um how am i doing for time oh, keep going. okay keep going <laughs> So pouching goals, right? The main thing is to make sure the skin is great. Um, I have ileostomy people thinking they have to dry their skin out. And they're going to have issues if they do that. Um, I, I get asked, can I take a shower with an ileostomy? With you have a colostomy, you can, chance, you can take a shower and probably be very safe, but an ileostomy goes often. So you can do that if that's your issue. You can go in and clean. They want to make sure their, clean, their skin is clean and dry and, and exposed to air because that's what's normal. Um, and some people, they just have to do that. They can. Um, but they're going to have to have a towel there <laughs> because they're going to go. And they get that. It won't take much for them to get that. Choosing the right pouch teach your nurses they have to know whether it's a poop pouch or a pee pouch and they have to know the differences that is the biggest thing you cannot um, and and I understand it I have many nurses put on a um, urostomy bag for an ileostomy because it's liquid so they just want to use the little valve because that's nice and easy the problem is, is that ileostomate eats. And so there will be tiny little chunks that come through that will block that um, urostomy um, spout, the valve. Yeah. So it won't work for them. I understand it. But the other thing is, and I think this is probably the most important thing for me, it makes me... Uh, I think nurses don't aren't aren't thinking through some things, so they want to put them. They know they want to put them in a convex pouch, because the flat is not working. So go to convex. Okay, perfect. Except that they only have a cut to fit, and it happens in the hospitals, and it happens in the skilled care. You only have a cut to fit convex pouch. Well, your ostomy. Your stoma is one inch. And if you look, I'm going to pass this around. If you look at a cut to fit pouch, it goes out to two inches. And your convexity is at two inches. It is not at one. So you are essentially putting on a convex or, or a flat pouch with a convexity out where it doesn't, it's, it's not helpful. So just to get the idea, right? Do you understand that? That's, in, that's for me, one of the most take-home things to do 
is to figure out that you are putting on a convexity for a one inch stoma, but the convexity in your cut to fit is two inches out. Right. You, you just did that. Yeah. Very well. Thank you very much, Pam. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Pictures all over the thousand words. Can you not pop it up with like a EK and a case? Uh, yeah. The case is coming out of the switch. Yes, so and they. Yes. Similar to EK. Yes, they make a um, convex ring yeah. at different sizes. If you're lucky, your hospital will carry those because that is the thing that will help you take your cut to fit um, convex and make it a fitted convexity. Um, but your skilled care facilities will not have that and the majority of hospitals, I don't think. Do you guys carry them, the rings? Do you use them? Do you use them? Are you talking about the adapter ring? Yeah, the adapter ring. Yeah. Overlays has them too. Yeah. They're a big sponsor and they do use them. Um, the convexity close to the stoma, like you're saying, is the most important though, because if you have a two inch cut to fit convexity, it's, the pressure is not where you need it. Exactly. And the pressure, pressure is not where you need it. And, and, it's, mm -hmm. and it truly is like putting on a flat. Right. So, so if we could teach our nurses who don't know about pouching, if they know that, if we have supplies for them to think about that, that's the biggest take home I would recommend teaching. <laughs> okay, so pouch removal, I already kind of said that. You want to shave for the folliculitis. You don't want to rip it off. And now they have such a great spray um, a couple of different companies have great spray for adhesive release. Awesome. Uh, emptying the pouch when it's a third full. I think I find most of the time in the hospital because the patients haven't been really taught nor are they really up to paying attention to it and the nurses and the aides are busy that those pouches get way too full whether it's from air or whether it's from liquid and the same in the skilled care. The, the person is not really aware of it, has not charge, and, um, and they have issues because the, particularly if it's gassy, the air can be so tight on that pouch that it actually pushes itself off the, your skin. And the weight of a full one is going gonna, is gonna to pull it off. So we have different products. What I teach patients about the products is that you have powder, which can, is for absorption. So in, if your mucocutaneous incision line is open or you have a little um, ulcer from pressure or something, you can put the powder on there. It's absorptive. That's its job. It's just absorptive. But it's like sugar. Then, then you cook it a little bit longer and it becomes a soft paste and you cook it a little longer, it becomes a, a ring. A little longer, it's an eakin. And a little longer, it's the barrier on, your, on the back of your pouch. So it's the same product, just, just cooked a little longer. That's what I teach my patients anyway. There are, I'm sure there's a, a couple of little different things in there, but um, what else? Let me keep going. We talked about the thin hydrocolloid barrier, and you guys have seen that, the curve. Things to think about for those who don't know ostomies, um, to use, to use a, a measuring before they cut, that they need to measure it for the first couple weeks, that you don't want to cut your wafer more than an eighth inch larger um, for an ileostomy, right? Otherwise, you're just going to have irritation all the way around. And you do want to use paste for an ileostomy most of the time. All of these are not absolutes, but they're things to just think about. 
if things are going wrong, if it's an ileostomy, try a little pastering. Um, you do want to empty the pouch before it's a third full. Don't ever poke a hole in a pouch to release gas. Well, <laughs> I, I beg to differ because now, now this is an old project product actually but it's it's called osteo ease and you do poke a hole in that pouch so that you can release gas it's a little door, it's a little door but you poke a hole in the pouch <laughs> put this little product on and then you have a little door to release gas it's going to be smelly it's not for an ileostomy it's for a colostomy and it's usually a person who just for whatever reason produces a lot of gas and maybe it's more difficult to empty and he can do slow release but that slow release if i was sitting next to you is gonna stink <laughs> <laughs> so they they do they'll probably go outside next to the marijuana smokers <laughs> and then oh i said do use a belt for a little tension at three and nine you don't always need a belt but if you're having issues with, with keeping it on, then a belt might be just the next tweak to do. Um, I prefer that you don't unsnap a two-piece, and it's usually the caregivers who are doing this. They want to unsnap it, take it over to the toilet, dump it, yeah. rinse it, and put it back on. Except that they create issues because they don't always get it on. It's another, it's another time when things don't go quite right. And the same for a patient. If they insist upon it, fine, but that's on you then <laughs> for making a mess. And so it's just one more thing that I, that I say, you're taking a chance. Up to you, but you're taking a chance. Oh, fun, the pancaking yeah, the pan around, because the, and that's a colostomy, won't yeah, happen with an ileostomy. The colostomy stool is pasty, thicker, yeah. and it doesn't it fall the stool, down. The wafer out when the because it's also catching, yeah. it's also catching underneath. That stool yeah. is coming up, your stoma is expanding. Yeah, yeah. And so for a colostomy, I have found that sometimes I have to make a bigger, a bigger opening for them if they're pancaking. No. No, because it's catching. If you if you think about if if you're looking underneath that pouch when you take it off, it's full of stool underneath it as well, and that's because it's it's that stoma has <coughs> bulged out. To get that firmer stool, so you wanna cut it a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger, and a colostomy can do that. A colostomy can do that without having any um, skin issues. And sometimes just cutting that pouch bigger is gonna be the solving tweak. Bigger than one and a half inch. Bigger than your eighth inch, one and exactly eight one, inch. one eighth, an okay. eighth inch. Bigger than an eighth inch, okay. not one and an eighth but that little tiny eighth inch, yeah. Yeah, sometimes that works. Divots, I have cut a colostomy yeah. really big to avoid a divot that's just couldn't get it to, to follow through. And it worked fine for them. And it was dexterity issues too. And I was fearful for their skin, but it worked and, and they were good. The thing about that is that stool doesn't sit on your skin for long. Most of it, well, it can, but it, it's not caustic as much, yeah. unless it's diarrhea. And then the other thing that gets me, so I mentioned already, don't cuff the end, or do cuff the end of your pouch, right, for cleaning. But I find patients and nurses want to wrap around that clamp a couple of times for security when actually then the little juices make it all the way around and there's a little odor. So once is enough, twice is too much.
that's me. Um, when, I, when I'm teaching a patient, I want to make sure that they can do it. I don't want to be the one who says, look, 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 look. It's going to take longer, and they're going to pay me because I'm coming out to their house to do it. So, but I tell them it's going to take at least an hour because they, they have to work through it themselves. And it's, it's kind of like doing it hands-on. Some people are very good about watching videos and then can do it. Those people are not the ones I'm having to come out to the house. It's the one who has to really do the hands-on and really get it. Um, and so I want to I make sure that they can do it even from the hospital when they don't want to look at it, when they don't want to do anything with it. I really encourage them that I want them to be the backup. That's how I start. Just be the backup. Learn it well enough that when your wife or your husband head out the door to go get groceries and your ileostomy pops the minute they leave and you can't get them because they're in traffic and they're not answering their cell phone, <laughs> that you have the confidence to at least put it on and be assured that it'll be okay they can check it when they get home. They can take it off and redo it as soon as the spouse gets home. But you have the confidence to be the backup. That is at least where they have to look. They have to participate minimally. They will have to clean it. They have to do it. And there are some cultures that are very, very hard to do, but it's still I haven't run into a culture yet that I haven't been able to teach. may take a little bit longer, but by starting there, that they are the backup. Questions? Um, when they leave the hospital, it's great that they get at least a week's supply. There's such a big hole that ostomy patients go into. And we try, but it still becomes a hole. And if you don't have them set up from the time they are leaving the hospital with something in their hands that they go home and have something to put on instead of the garbage bag that they have to lean over, where else are they going to get these supplies? All of a sudden, the family hasn't been listening, too much going on. They don't quite get it have you from the get-go from the hospital do you have them set up even if they go into skilled care which is the biggest hole because nobody in skilled care knows ostomy and they will take your pouches that you sent them home with the three that you sent them home with hopefully and then they'll use those and go oh where's a pouch and they'll go into the closet and they'll find anything anything to put them on because they're going and there will be um it takes them three weeks to get supplies <coughs> because they are using they're not ordering through byram or edge park or any of the suppliers that the ostomy nurses go through and get them within a day they're not doing that they're going through their main um skilled care supplier that takes three weeks I swear to you, three weeks to get those supplies. I'm like, no, you have to order specifically now through this number. <laughs> you know, so be very specific. Maybe even, I would love it if, if in the acute setting, the patients were given an ostomy supply company number and have already been set up by an ostomy nurse in that company for when they get done with skilled care. The name is already there. They know that they're not going to be calling them because they're in skilled care, but in four weeks, give a shout out, find out where that patient is and get them supplies. At least they're connected. And if the family still has some whereabouts and, and understands, they'll be calling. And they'll say, yeah, your ostomy nurse said this product. Oh, well, it won't be that product because 
skilled care put them in a convex cut to fit. <laughs> so I'm just saying that's one, that's one thing that I have found is helpful in to, for those skilled care patients and to have a, an appointment already scheduled for skilled care patient to come back out of skilled care to see an ostomy nurse. And if you don't write the order in skilled care, it's not happening at that end. They're not thinking about it. So please do that. Um, mm -hmm. So some of the frequently asked questions that I have from patients. Can I do the same things I did before? Well, they don't feel like it right now, but yes, absolutely. In, in your rest period, you know, you just had surgery. You just had tummy surgery. So know that you have to let that rest first, and then you can get back at it. But you can weight lift. I have ostomy patients who are bulked out and fit and have a six-pack. So they can do that. They can be pregnant. Um, what else? Jackhammers. I have an ostomy patient who runs a jackhammer. He's got a, a one of the new, there's some covers that are coming out now, um, and that's working for him. But he used to put a metal plate. He had a, a hernia belt that he would put over, and he'd slip a metal plate across. It was nice and wide, a little heavy, but he had jeans that held it. And then he could jackhammer on the other side. Oh, that didn't take away the vibration? It didn't take away the vibration, but it kept the bruising from happening. Uh, didn't it make him go more? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Probably not. It probably stopped things. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't ask him that. I have a patient who um, goes to the hot tub twice a day and doesn't change his pouch for two weeks. Wow. And his skin is perfect. Right? So, again, you're teaching your patients what's your routine. It's not to be lying on your bed and having your wife change it. That's not routine for potty training. So the potty training is to get up to your sink so that you can st This is me, right? This is my thing. Get up to the sink so that you can lean against it, and if you have anything come out, it goes into the sink. That's a nice, clean, easy, down the drain to the same sewer as your toilet, right? And you're there in front of the sink, and you're getting all your stuff right here, and it is before breakfast, before you've had coffee, because if you wait for the coffee, you're gonna be going, right? Unless you, make, unless you take marshmallows. And you have to do it at that time. Or sometimes in the evening you've already not been drinking for a while so that you're not going to be peeing in the middle of the night and have to get up. Um, and then again, changing promptly. Don't wait for the wife to come home at the end of the day. Know that you have to change it. Don't wait. You, you may have to wait for the end of the meeting depending on how important it is. But if you're an ileostomate and you feel that burning... I'd miss my meeting and go change. How often should you empty the pouch? I think we all know the, the third full, if gas. They have to set their alarms, some of them, for the middle of the night, particularly ileostomies with high volume. Um, sometimes that's the thing that you've done everything and they're still leaking, and they say it's leaking at night. Well, it's, they're either rolling on it and it's full, or, um, you know, most of the time I find that it's, it's full. I have had them, they, side liars, they want to lay sideways. You can lay sideways with an ostomy. Put a pillow here. Put your leg up there. You've got a hole. You can lay. Don't be afraid to try things. I have many of those ostomates that we send home go to bed they've never been back liars and they go to bed and they're on their back and they're just so afraid to turn your rostomies don't want to pull on that tubing and they just yes you've got to get comfortable first and then work where the tubing is going to go have any of you worked with uh, your rostomies for nighttime 
going into a jug, the drainage jug, or the Foley bag. Yeah. The, yeah, I really like the jug. It's got a, and the reason is because it's got a nice wide mouth so that it can be rinsed well. And then um, it's, it's just more dexterity. It's easier for dexterity and, and easier for cleaning. To try and clean a Foley bag, <laughs> I find messy and a pain. <laughs> I was going to say a pain in something, but a pain. Um, what should I tell my children? Well, that's difficult. Some children don't want to look at it, and that's fine. Some children really want to look at it. <laughs> And then it's harder for the patient than it is for the child. Um, and I'm, I'm one for making sure that, you know, it's, it's comfortable for both of you. You know, don't force the child to look at it. But they're going to, children ask questions and they want to know what's going on. And so if the question comes up, you talk about it. But you don't have to go through the whole thing. You know, dad was sick or mom was sick. And now I have to wear this bag. Oh, okay. And that may be enough for your child. They may not want to know what's in that button. What does that button do? They probably don't. Right? Um, what else? Sexual dysfunction. I think that as a nurse in the hospital, it's important for you to know whether or not your patient has a rectum. Like you want to know whether they have an amputated toe. If they don't have a rectum, they are at high risk for having sexual dysfunction with the surgery that went on for them. And nobody asks them the questions. The docs don't talk about it. It's the nurses who do. And there's very few nurses who know to talk about it. And oftentimes I find it's just the question, hey, do you have a rectum? And are you okay with your sex life? Are you having difficulties? And then you look at the spouse because, oh, yeah, we're fine. <laughs> right? <laughs> and it usually goes like that. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, certainly after surgery. Nobody's going to feel like it. Neither one. One's afraid. The spouse is afraid. The patient isn't even interested. So they have some issues to work through. But, but I think it's important to just ask that question. And it can be as funny as just that. You know, and, and then you don't have to go further. Because it's there if they want to ask. If they have some questions, you know, you have some resources for them if they if they want. Sue. Yeah. So, interesting thing. Um, when you pointed towards me, thank you. <laughs> um, so, when I did um, home health and I did Ask Me Teaching, um, I would pretty much always bring up sex at some point in time to at least approach the subject to say, you know, a lot of people want to return to having a sex life and they have a lot of questions. Here are some resources. But I found that and when I asked the patients, all the male patients told me that their doctors had talked to them because those are usually male surgeons, and so they did bring it up. It's the female patients who the surgeons would not discuss it with. Uh huh. So that's just been my experience that the women need more assistance and need permission to have a problem, whereas the men have already been given permission right. to have a problem. Right. I also think that the surgery is more of a male issue than it is a female issue but it's a female issue on the other side. Well, I find it's still a female issue surgically for the woman who has the ostomy because things shift. Yeah. And now the vagina and the uterus and all their stuff are in different places. And so the position that the woman is accustomed to and enjoys is now uncomfortable. Oh, interesting. So. I didn't know that that would I be. I Dorothy Doughty. Really? Yeah. Dorothy Doughty. Yeah. Hmm. Well, well, she says it. <laughs> Right. They have, like you said, removed the rectum, removed um, the uterus, and all, everything else. Everything does shift. And because Brenda talks about that in her book, Brenda Elsinger talks about right. it in her book, um, that it absolutely changed. 
It does absolutely change, yeah. Yeah, and you're right, depending on the surgery and how <laughs> intense that is. Right, right. Reconstruction. Um, another good resource is the book, um, It's in the Bag and Under the Covers, and that's her book about sexuality and about having a stoma and dealing with sexuality. It's, it's like a Reader's Digest version of a variety of patients and how they dealt with having a stoma and their sex life and that type of thing. So it's interesting. It's in the bag and under the covers. It's in the bag and under the covers. <laughs> you see what we're saying? Yes. So, um, well, <laughs> sex is a popular topic. <laughs> for, um, there's been a lot of quality of life uh, studies for people who, have, who are ostomates. And um, at least all the studies that I have seen that for ostomates that deal with um, their sex life, pretty much every person who has an ostomy from their sex life before they had an ostomy and their sex life after having it now becoming an ostomate has changed negatively. If not physically, at least psychologically, because now you have this bag on the outside and it's very psychologically challenging for patients. And so it's a huge issue and one you definitely need to bring up with your patients. <coughs> so before we close, I want to encourage you also to remember that um, colostomy patients can irrigate their bowel and have just a little band-aid over their stoma for the day and not worry about it and they may go every two or three days instead so they actually give themselves an enema and they use this little cone it, it goes right into the stoma and actually goes all the way in not just a little bit don't be if you're teaching not it's, it goes all the way in, right? And then you have high, hot, and hell of a lot. Remember that saying from way back when you gave an enema? It's the same. High, hot, and hell of a lot. And you, you fill your bag, and you give it, you're giving 1,000 to 15,000 cc's. And it's fairly warm, and it's high, and that's a fair amount of water right you want to do it nice and slow to um, get used to it but in you know sometimes it takes 20 minutes sometimes it's gonna the whole procedure made the the putting in of the liquid takes minimal time um, even if you do it slowly you know it's going to be five over five minutes ten minutes um, depending on how uncomfortable your your surgical site is really your stoma and and how it's constructed um, but your activity afterwards may take up to an hour. And so this is what I'm showing you, but I didn't grab. I thought it was actually inside the pouch or inside the box. But there's actually a just a, a very long pouch that you put over top of your stoma. You have a fold at the top, so you put, you put the cone inside and everything that comes out of the Sonoma is collected in this very long pouch that goes into the toilet. And you can fold it up and kind of stand up. You can take your phone calls. I wouldn't leave the bathroom, but <laughs> I have asked them. I've asked the classmates, well, can you kind of walk around? Because I want to do my hair and I want to, yeah, you can do your hair. but. Stay, stay close, <laughs> stay close, because it can be explosive. Um, but, then, but then they're done. So that hour, they're done. And then they don't go for the next day or two to three days usually. It extends it. Yeah. Okay, what else? Traveling. Um, I did include here um, um, the TSA little card from UOAA. It's, it's in this next slide. Um, you want to know what your supply numbers are because when you're gone in Europe, you might be fine. If you're going to South Africa or Costa Rica, you might have a little bit harder time. Honduras, I'm sure. Um, so you want to make sure that you have enough pouches, more pouches than you think for your travel because things will be different. Just like when we go traveling, the bowels don't always stay the same as this if you were at home. So you want to have extras. You want them not in the bag that went to 
Honduras when you were actually going to Costa Rica. Um, you want to uh, make sure, I, I think I would like to sit in an aisle seat rather than the window seat now, not only because of the last, <laughs> you know, fin that went through the window, but because it's also actually easier to get to the bathroom. Um, you do want to remember that you have to drink while you're on the plane and it's actually good. That's why they serve those drinks so that then you have to get up and go to the bathroom. You'll be getting up to go to the bathroom like everybody else. Although some of those people certainly can drink a lot more and not have to go. Um, the air pressure, and I'm not sure that I ever thought about that. And, and actually I, I had, I knew about it and I always kind of talked about it. But I just went on a trip, <laughs> a 17-hour trip on a plane, and this woman had bought these special potato chips that she could get only in um, South Africa where this her friend knew they could have them. So she had them. Well, as we were landing, not going up, and all the time, that 17-hour flight, but as we were landing, it popped and all the potato chips everywhere <laughs> and I'm like oh oh an ostomy bag can you imagine so keep your hand on your ostomy bag because if you get above what what did I say I think it's a 1500 feet or something there is a number um, if you get up high you will have the same kind of issues. You're going to have more air in that pouch. But if, if your pouch has a bin, would, would that still happen? Uh, you know, probably if your vent is you know, working. The vent, the vent's a very, very slow release. Of right. Now, you have an expansion, which you would, as you go up, because I think the plane's pressure is 10,000 feet. 10,000. That's right. So 1,500. case in point and she wanted to take it home and this is they let us do it I can't believe they let us do it but it was across our laps it was so big and as we got to 10,000 feet it got just a little tighter and it went kaboom <laughs> <laughs> so so a pouch would be similar I'm sure and the vents I don't think would be real helpful so definitely empty before you get on fabulous idea putting your hand on just the pouch. just to wa you know just monitor it, it. You can easily, you can easily um, release, release the air. Yeah, but you know what? So I'm, I, um, I'm with the East Side Ostomy Support Group, and um, this next month, you all are invited. Um, we have a, a gentleman who has, um, since uh, I think he was not birth but childhood um, has had an ileostomy and has traveled the world and he shows the different toilets that he has ended up in and <laughs> but he's never talked about his bursting pouch in air so I am so excited to ask him about that whether he's had that issue at all because ileostomates will not have a filter yeah um, and also just just to be aware too that um, oftentimes the colostomy people, if they irrigate or they wash their pouches, um, they often rinse them. If you're in a country with unfit drinking water, your stoma will absorb that and then you will have fun. Oh, I see that face. <laughs> yeah, that's just messed up. Yeah. So again, pack twice as much as you think you may need. Um, take bags out of the boxes for easier packing. Uh, have a, for colostomy, have a diarrhea remedy with you. And um, small travel kit that you can take for just your short outings because you don't have to carry everything. And then um, all your emergency medical information, right? Um, 
your travel, that's your travel card. One side it gets folded in half and then the right is the other side. It's something this big restroom access required is something you can give your stewardess and say, I know that the pilot says go sit down and you're about ready to announce me, but here's my card and I'm going into that toilet because you don't want me in that seat. <laughs> and I think they get it. I think they get it. Um, the other thing is, is um, still to this day, we've made a lot of head work, but getting patted down through the line, it's embarrassing. Even if you show them the card, it's still embarrassing. It's, they will still pat you down because, you know, people are not trustworthy, and that's a big part of it, you know. And so they do have to trust you down. They do not have to lift your shirt and say, hey, I want to see that. And in fact, the Osmid is like, yeah. <laughs> 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 sure, here you are. So, right. Um, the other thing is I want to just remind you about the chemo. And I put in some of the basic side effects to be aware of, the stomatitis, the dermatitis, um, just everything j just gets fragile with some of those chemo meds. I mean, does the chemo uh, waste will affect the life, the shelf life of the pouch? Mm. Will it? Will it that's a very good question. I've never seen a, a pouch disintegrate, but I'll bet it might. The life of the pouch? That's a very good question. I don't know. But um, um, write that down for me. I I had a yeah right there, yeah I'll find out. I'm not sure who will be. Yeah. I've. Yeah. And I'm thinking that in the support group too, there's a lot of I would say the majority are because of cancer and have gone through chemo and nobody has talked about that issue. Sure, but their bodily fluid is dealt with because of the med that's in it. Yeah. Not because it's caustic, but because now you could get chemo. Yeah. Right? So that's why that is specific. But I don't think... But because, like, you have to wear nitrile gloves. With nitrile gloves? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, if, if that waste could potentially arm your clothing because you have to dress up. I'm just wondering if that could also affect the integrity of the Osmi appliances. It would be interesting to know. I'm not sure anybody's done the study to find out whether that med has carried through to the outside of the pouch. Yeah. And not only that, but you're wearing that pouch yeah. and and you definitely are emptying. Yeah. And so there's still chemo that is yeah. getting exposed to. It's it's an interesting I haven't thought about it. Do they get teaching about, like, when you live in a household where that has family members who are not, like, they could be exposed? Sure, just like you get teaching about C. Yeah. diff, you know, yeah. and MRSA. I'm sure that they do get that teaching. I know they do get that teaching, that they have to be very careful about that. But that's still, MRSA, you're still going to get exposed. Right, but, but your patient who goes home. Yeah, yeah. But at home, like in the hospital, when people come for visit, we don't make them to wear what we wear to touch the patient. Which because is too bad. We're going from patient to patient. We are going from patient to patient. So we are not allowed to take this patient sure. to the other. Sure. That's not as. That's yeah. not treated as. Uh, well, it'll be treated this. Yeah. yeah, 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 interesting. I'll find out more about that, absolutely. 
Thank you. So what about a colonoscopy? You get to skip the Ducalux, <laughs> right? And you get to drink, but you do have to drink the prep until you run clear, right? And they will go through the ileostomy to check the small bowel, and then they'll go up through the Hartman's pouch, if you have it. They'll go up through the rectum to check that area as well. Um, what about... Uh, the patient who um, is getting constipated and the doctor said, oh, give them a suppository. So you're looking at a colostomy. Give them a suppository. Is that doable? Yes, it is. If you put it in the stoma with the peristalsis, it's not going to last in the stoma for very long and it's going to be right out. But if you put it into the rectum, it will stay in that Hartman's pouch and it will be systemically effective. Very interesting. Cardiac stress tests. Just make sure your pouch is, you've got your workout tights on and your bike speedos for men and that your pouch is, because you will be going and you will be sweating and have some equipment, some extras with you because if you're not used to that, you may sweat it off, you may knock it off. So just be prepared. That's part of learning how to get back to exercise as well. Physical therapy. Make sure you tell them you have an ostomy. Don't keep it secret because they will be putting, if you're working on a hip and you don't tell them about an ostomy, they may be having you in different positions that could put the ostomy in a insecure spot, right? And then, of course, a massage. Please go get a massage. But you just have to tell the massage p therapist and, and also know, have, have, have some idea how you can put your own body lying on your tummy with a pouch whether the pillow has to go here, help your massage out, but get your massage, right? But you have to be the one to help your massage therapist know how to position that pouch so that you can do that. And then expect that you will have an increase in output during the procedure or just after a massage. All of us do that. But with an ileostomy, you don't have that sphincter control. You, you make sure you're empty before you go in. Because that would be that would be something that could could be triggered. We talked about, and there we are. Get back to life. I love that. I wish my car was like that. <laughs> okay. Any questions, Miss Pam? You have the floor. Oh my. Do you want me to hold this? You have things to show and Dude. tell. Do you want it YouTube, for the YouTube or? Um, if you want to, we can leave it on. Oh, sure. and then they can oh, listen yeah. to questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll so, you know what? It's going to be very, very brief. Um, one of the things I was going to talk about was the Hydrofair Blue Ring that we have yeah. for patients who have uh, a wound around their ostomy site. Um, it's very good with pyoderma and that type of thing. Um, let me, in fact, I'll let you hold this and I'll And the ring looks like this. And the, the shiny side goes against the barrier. So it would go on the barrier. And the actual foam side goes against the patient's skin. Now, obviously, the patient's stone is not going to be this size. So you cut it to piece where the, the patient has the irritation around the stoma. And um, with and you would likely need to go up a flange size. So this is a two, this is a 57 millimeter flange. You want to go up a flange size because you're adding something to it and you need a little more barrier to go around that, that stoma site. Um, what you 
do, you do moisten this because this is a classic type, but it's, it is um, a classic hydrofera blue, so you do need to moisten it. And I'll pass this around. All you do, you don't moisten it a ton. You just add a little bit of moisture. And um, you, can, you can tell how it, uh, we'll pass it all the way around. Uh, you don't want it so, so damp that it's gonna, um, it's going to make that wafer come off. But um, it's covered by insurance, actually. Uh, but you have to document a wound. It, it, there has to be a, a wound around that stoma site. Mm -hmm. um, so this will be, uh, will this be killed by yeast? Um, you know, it's not an antifungal. Oh, okay. And so with yeast, you would want an antifungal powder. Okay. Uh, I recommend a powder, of course, not a, not a cream. Sometimes doctors will recommend a cream thinking it's an antifungal, like something under a breast or something like that, but it's a, it's a powder that you need um, to make sure that the appliance will stick. Yeah, that is um, anti, so it's antibacterial. So it has gentian violet methylene blue, would be effective against gram positive and gram negative organisms, um, but it's not, a, it's not an antifungal. You'd want an antifungal oh, okay. for yeast. Good question though. Yeah, really good question. So the other thing as far as wounds, because we're talking, you know, we're, we're in a, amongst a bunch of wound care nurses, so wounds around the stoma. One of the other um, things I wanted to share with you, this is a patient that I, I used to talk to with over the phone, and this, I think she has pyloderma. Um, you can kind of see, for those of you, are, how many are familiar with pyloderma? Almost everybody. So this particular patient, and I'll start here and you can pass it around. She, I think, had a pyloderma, but she was wearing a firm convexity, a real rigid convexity. And one of the things um, Hollister has is a soft convexity. So if you have a rigid convexity and you have a stoma that maybe has a hernia, and you have something very firm on there, you're gonna get some irritation and you're gonna get a pressure sore. Um, the soft convexity, which is what this is, this is underneath this barrier. This is a firm convexity under here. You can see by putting a soft convexity on, I'll pass this around, it, it just goes and bends with the patient. And so you're not gonna get that um, irritation. The other thing, really the last thing that I wanted to share with you is the ceramide barriers are, um, how many are you familiar with ceramide barriers? Niacinamide. What's that? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, ceramide, yeah. well, for, the, and for those of you who aren't, because we talked about wounds and you talked about itching around the stoma and that type of thing, um, it's been, ceramide is, is infused into uh, many of Hollister's barriers now. So what the ceramide does is it protects the skin and it decreases trans epidermal water loss. So it, so patients who have itching, um, they don't have that itching anymore. It, it went away and they thought itching was normal and it doesn't have to be normal. Um, the last two years that I've been with Hollister with the ostomy division, it's been really fun to go to UOA meetings because patients are coming up and, and saying, hey, in fact, the, one of my patients, it was at the Everett UOA, he goes, remember six months ago you came and you talked to me about that ceramide barrier? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, I got sampled. I said, good. So how did it go? And he goes, you know what? I have to date my pouches now. And I go, what do you, why? And he goes, because it feels so good. I forget to change it. And so his wife's sitting right here, and she goes, yeah, it's saving us a ton of money, too. Because <laughs> he's wearing it for nine days, oh, which, wow. you know. Uh, and he was a high output ileostomy. Yeah. So, so anyway, that's, that's really kind of all I have. Um, I, I've been with Hollister 18 years. I am resigning. Oh. I know, as of May 31st, um, is my last day with Hollister. I know. <coughs> um, just they, they, yeah, long story. They, they needed someone, they wanted someone in Seattle, and I really can't move. So, but I, the new, the good news is I am going to be representing Hydro Fair Blue. Yes. And in Deform. And so um, you'll see me back in the wound care side um, with Indeform.
uniform and hide their hair blue. But I do love ostomy, so I will absolutely talk ostomy anytime. <laughs> so, and that's all I have. You know, I know it's getting late in the evening, so I certainly want to um, thank you very much for inviting me. So much appreciated, and what a wonderful talk. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, it's really good. Does anybody know how to not know how to prep? Just by chance? You know how to prep? Yeah, yeah, yeah.